Over the years, Tomorrow's World has followed the progress of high-speed levitating trains, but today there are only three low-speed systems actually carrying paying passengers. So whatever happened to the dream of the flying train travelling at half the speed of sound? This linear electric motor powers the model of the first British hover train. The oval mountings are the hover pads, and when in action, the hover train runs virtually frictionless on a pad of air. The present model does 25 miles an hour, which is equivalent to 375 miles an hour scaled up, a normal speed for what the designers hope will be the intercity travel of the future. Like that prototype from 1966, all the early trains were propelled by one of these, a linear motor, a flat electric motor. Now, watch what happens when I sprinkle on iron filings onto this. Now, what you're seeing is the magnetic field which travels along like a wave along the length. You can see it travelling there. And that wave provides the force to drive the train along. Lifting the trains off their tracks to give a friction-free, silent ride is a different problem. The hovercraft principle was abandoned in Britain because, at high speeds, it could be unstable. A better method was developed using magnetic attraction. Now, using a carefully controlled electromagnet, this ball bearing can be made to float at a constant height. This model shows how combining that magnetic levitation and a linear motor for propulsion could make a working train. And by the late 70s, British Rail adapted the techniques for a full-size version. But instead of hanging under the track, the carriage sits above it, with the electromagnets beneath lifting it into the air. The challenge, then, was to make the system deliver a stable ride. Set up like this, the new vehicle will rock quite happily backwards and forwards. But by strengthening the current to the electromagnets, it suddenly becomes rock hard, producing a quite different sort of ride. All of which means this system is capable of doing safely and comfortably what no system like it has managed to do in the past. And that is to go up hills, and to go round corners. All that's needed now is a customer with the nerve to become the world's first operator. In 1984, that challenge was taken up by Birmingham International Airport, which became the world's first commercial operator of a magnetic levitating train. It's still running, but it only has a top speed of 30 miles an hour. Meanwhile, the only countries funding serious research into high-speed versions were Germany and Japan. I visited the Japanese test track in 1982. A small test train has already rocketed down this track at speeds of over 320 miles an hour. And rocketed is the right word. The trains that use it are trains that fly. E. It's Stop. Not Initially, as the train builds up speed, it runs on wheels. But when it's going fast enough, at about 100 miles an hour, the wheels are withdrawn and the train is airborne. The Japanese don't levitate their trains by attraction. They use repulsion. At speed, magnets here on the train produce opposing magnetic forces in the track, pushing it up into the air but this method of levitation isn't very stable. To lift a 20-ton train, the magnets also have to be extremely powerful, and their strong fields could affect passengers unless there was expensive shielding. Meanwhile, for 15 years, the Germans have stuck to the same levitation principle used in the Birmingham train, but with a much modified motor. Successful high-speed runs this summer convinced American backers to promote this German system into the marketplace. They're looking for $500 million from investors to build a track 260 miles long from Las Vegas to Disneyland at Anaheim. Because aeroplanes are now frequently delayed on short routes, they believe this new train could at last compete with air travel. If all goes well, the world's first floating high-speed passenger service might just be completed 
before the end of this century.